Welcome to the Green Portal, a forum for issues related to people, politics, and economy as it affects our planet. If you're like me, you may wonder, can our economy continue to grow at the current pace? Is 3% GDP or even 2% GDP truly sustainable? We hear the numbers each day, but do they truly reflect how the flow of goods and services that we call an economy affect our planet or our lives? Some economists, like Dr. Farad Kavari, author of Toward a Zero Cost Economy, do not think we need continuous income growth to increase personal wealth. Though at first it may sound radical, Dr. Kavari makes a sound argument that GDP and income growth will not make us wealthier, let alone happier. Dr. Kavari suggests that our competitive, consumption-driven economy requires ever-increasing income, which makes us vulnerable to ever-increasing debt. In such an economy, workers are driven by fear because without health care, an illness or the loss of a job can be catastrophic, as we know. Dr. Kavari suggests, rather than focus on continuous growth, focus instead on sustained cost reduction. What if the situation was reversed and your overhead cost declined? Your wealth might even increase, even if your income did not. To be sure, this model would require universal health care, people-friendly pharmaceutical, utility, transportation, taxes, and food costs, for starters. But when your overhead is reduced, you need less income. Getting to zero cost may not be achievable, but certainly we are seeing ways to reduce cost. For example, new technologies are offering ways to get off the grid and reduce the burning of fossil fuels that powered the Industrial Revolution. A complete transformation will take time. And at first, these new technologies are expensive. But things are changing, and they're changing very rapidly. Just in the last decade, solar and wind technologies are becoming more and more affordable. And they are not only for new construction. Here is a great example from Tesla that could change the utility industry virtually overnight. Take a look at the roofs of these four houses. Can you spot which one is covered in solar cells? That's a trick question, because they all are. Tesla's first ever solar product is stunning. It's not a solar panel. Instead, it's a range of four solar roofing materials that look virtually indistinguishable from high-end terracotta, slate, or slick modern asphalt shingles. People really care about their homes. They love their homes, and, and they really want them to be better. And I think taking this approach, it can be. Here's how it works. The top of the roof tile is made of textured glass. It looks like shingles from most angles, but it allows sunlight to pass through from above and into a standard solar cell with almost no loss in efficiency. Tesla says the glass is as tough as steel and can weather a lifetime of abuse from the elements. It can also be fitted with heating elements to melt off snow in colder climates. Active solar tiles will cost about $42 per square foot, cheaper than traditional shingles with solar panels on top. But ultimately, you'll probably need more tiles to do the same job, so Tesla's total roof cost could be a bit higher. You want to call your neighbors over and say, check out, check out the sweet roof. Um, <laughs> it's like not a phrase that you hear often. This represents the grand unification of Tesla's plans to become a sun-to-vehicle energy company. The idea is that you can run your home on solar power, store it in a slim battery that hangs on your wall, and then use that electricity to power your home and car. This combination is perhaps the closest we've ever come to affordable off-grid electricity. The goal is to make solar roofs that look better than a normal roof, generate electricity, have last longer, have better insulation, um, and actually have an installed cost that is less than a normal roof plus the cost of electricity. So then, then why would you buy anything else? Why would you buy anything else? It's not only Tesla. According to Jeremy Rifkin, we are at the beginning of a civilization transforming third industrial revolution. 
This is a revolution. This is a revolution. This is a revolution. This is a revolution. The question becomes this. If millions and hundreds of millions of people can begin to produce, consume, or share their own information goods, energy, and a lot of their manufactured goods at near zero marginal cost, making them nearly free and beyond the exchange model of the capitalist market, what kind of new economic system do we have to envision to organize the world, the one that I'm laying out here? It's the social commons. What's happening now is the social commons, which is a venerable institution that we rely on for educational institutions, our nonprofit, health services, daycare centers for our children, assisted living for the elderly, environmental organizations, cultural, sports, arts, it goes on and on. If they were eliminated and we just had the marketplace, we would not have much of a life on the planet. The social commons is ignored by economists because it doesn't create finance capital. It creates social capital, but it's a big revenue player. What's making this social commons now more relevant than any time in the past is this Internet of Things. Because the Internet of Things is a general purpose technology platform that's designed to be the technological soulmate of a social commons. The whole design is to be it distributed, collaborative, scales laterally, not vertically, and it rewards collaboration across these lateral networks. It creates a sharing community. If millions and millions of people are producing and sharing their own energy and 3D printed products and information goods, they're going to need less income at zero marginal cost. They're still gonna need employment. If the marketplace doesn't need them because we can produce the, the energy and the products, you know, in the marketplace with just high technology, where will you get the employment? In the social commons. The social commons creates social capital, human beings with the other human beings, creating communities, cultural, sports, arts, wellness, health, quality of life. Those are the more important employments. Making widgets is not as intellectually challenging and motivating to the human mind as it is trying to create a sense of human community, a sense of transcendence, a sense of finding meaning in the world. Finding meaning in the world. This is what I was looking for as a young man in 1969 when I encountered the Whole Earth Catalog, which really was the beginning of the technology revolution that we are in the midst of today. And from it, I encountered Buckminster Fuller's book, Utopia or Oblivion. Since that time, we have become closer to either one. It is now, more than ever, up to us. What do we need to do, and what will prevent us from doing it? Last thought. We can get to nearly free energy. We're already there, nearly free goods and services, but without food and water, we don't survive. And we don't know if we can even feed people and provide water for people. How do we repopulate millions of people in the western part of the U.S. in 30 years? So, climate change is the elephant in the room. What's important to acknowledge here is that the third industrial revolution, this internet of things, allows us to move quickly out of fossil fuels and have millions of people begin to produce and share their own green energy. And this internet of things because its entire purpose is to increase efficiencies, to reduce marginal costs, it means it shows us how to use less resources more effectively. So we don't put a big um, burden on the planet that we live in. So we have young people here not only sharing information goods and energy now and 3D printed products, but so we have car sharing and bike sharing and now we're sharing apartments and homes and clothes and tools and toys. So we have a generation that's beginning to believe it's not about ownership, it's access. And if more people share what they have, less has to be produced. It does have a negative impact on GDP, but it has a positive impact on quality of life, and that's the way to measure a good economy. It isn't just technology. What it does is it democratizes the economy. And hopefully you'll be in a world in 2050 that won't be the 1% or the 99%. It'll be a shared economy a sustainable, good quality of life where no one's left behind. Now, is it utopia? No. We need to change the human narrative. We need a new story for the human race to go with the technology. We have to move from geopolitics to biosphere consciousness in one generation. Everything we do intimately impacts 
some other human, some other ecosystem, some other species on this earth. We got a young generation here that's beginning to see we live in one indivisible community, the biosphere. So I'm guardedly hopeful. And if we can dramatically increase efficiencies, reduce our marginal costs, and that means using less resources more effectively and taking a less burden on the planet, we may get to a better world by mid-century. You need to help lead this so we have a chance of rehealing the planet and creating a future for our children.